In our second episode of Lest We Forget, even at a huge disadvantage, Americans defeated British troops at the Battle of Plattsburgh, leading William Miller to question whether or not God intervenes in human affairs. Could it really, could it really be that there is a God who looks after the affairs of nations? And these, these thoughts are beginning to go through his mind. Now, he's not yet converted, okay? But he is beginning to think about it. He's thinking about the men he saw died, blown, uh, that, who died, and were blown to pieces and all this. And he says, he writes later, he's thinking, annihilation. Annihilation was a cold and chilling thought. The heavens were as brass over my head, and the earth as iron under my feet. Eternity, what was it? Death and death, why was it? These thoughts, the Holy Spirit's beginning to move in on his mind at this period of time. With spirituality still asleep, Miller begins to attend the Baptist church. And after replacing the preacher of the day in reading a sermon, he is impacted and decides to go deeper into Bible study. Now for the first time in his life, he's going to begin studying his Bible. He wants to know what kind of a God is revealed in Scripture. And uh, you all are historians, or most of you, you know what his method of Bible study was. Well, he started with Genesis 1-1, and he begins to read through the Bible. He has no commentaries at this point. He'll have them later in his life, but he has no commentaries. He has a crudence concordance. His question, what kind of a God is revealed in Scripture? That's where he's at in this point in his experience. When he comes to a word that he does not know the meaning of, he doesn't go to the dictionary. Instead, he goes to the concordance. He looks up every other place in the Bible where that word is used, and he keeps moving forward. Sometime during the period from 1816 to 1818, he comes across the text that forever he will be uh, linked with uh, yeah, in his life, the rest of his life, and that is unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And I can picture him uh, saying to himself, sanctuary, sanctuary. And looking up all the different definitions of sanctuary. You know, there's a heavenly sanctuary, and the earth's a sanctuary, and the body's a sanctuary. There's all these different things. And in his mind, he cannot believe that there's anything in heaven that needs to be cleansed. A text that led William Miller to the assumption of an approximate date for Jesus' return to the earth again. And he thinks to himself, my new best friend will be coming back to earth? This is about 1818, or coming back to Earth in about 25 years? Could William Miller be correct? How would this discovery affect his family and friends? Would he take his findings and share them publicly? That is what we are going to find out in this third episode of Lest We Forget. What do you do when God calls you to do something you feel completely unqualified for? Throughout history, God has a track record of choosing the unlikeliest of people for his purposes. Moses, a murderer and ex-prince. Gideon, a fearful farmer. David, a simple shepherd and the youngest of his family. Peter, a bombastic fisherman. Martin Luther, a simple monk. The list could go on, almost without end. Today, as our story continues, William Miller comes face to face with the challenge of a promise made and a God who answers. William Miller did not immediately begin to preach what he had discovered in the scriptures. 
It took him time to start sharing what he had learned in his daily studies, even in a private setting, though he was convinced that he was being guided to truths never before preached. He did not feel qualified to talk about them publicly with others. It seems that the Baptist preacher had been suddenly called away from their little church over in Dresden, New York, and uh, Guilford, Mr. Brother Guilford, William Miller's brother-in-law, had to arrange for the services, and uh, so he said, well, well, go over and get Uncle William to come over and talk to us about the prophecies. And uh, William Miller was not a happy camper, as we would say in today's language. He was angry at himself. He'd made this commitment. He goes storming out into the maple grove out here that we'll walk through. He's yelling at, at God. He's shaking his fist at God. He's angry at God for, um, for this, this thing that's just happened. And um, his little daughter, Lucy, youngest daughter, comes out, sees her father out there in the maple grove, goes running back into the house, saying, Mama, Mama, come quick, something's happened to Papa. And sure enough, something had happened to Papa, as one historian many years, Adventist historian many years ago said, William Miller went into that grove of trees, a farmer, and he came out a preacher. And he agreed to go with his nephew over to Dresden. And that afternoon, they traveled over there, and the next day, William Miller gave his first lecture, talk, on the soon coming of Jesus as he understood it. Now, was it one of these nice, beautiful, little, white New England churches with a spire on it? No, not according to the record. He was still kind of nervous, you know. He was not quite ready to do this preaching publicly. So they invited the members of that little Baptist church over to the Guilford home. And we're told that he sat, William Miller sat in his sister's chair and opened the Bible and began to share with these people why he thought his best friend Jesus would be coming back in just a few years. And they got excited and they asked him to stay. And we're told he stayed all week. You see, once he got started, he had a lot more to say than he thought he had. When he got back home, he had a, a request from the associate pastor of the Baptist church over here in East Poultney, or Poultney then, and uh, so he went and had a second series over there. So within just a week of his commitment to God, if I'm ever asked, I will go preach. He had his first two invitations. And now he begins to speak. As invitations would come, he would go and share. Now at first, of course, there weren't too many invitations, but eventually there were several, and they kept increasing. And if you look at, he kept a textbook of where he preached, and the sermon, the text that he used, and that kind of thing, very interesting to go through. And if you kind of plot it on a map, sort of like pebble dropping in the water, and the circle keeps getting larger. As one minister would talk to another pastor and say, you know, if you want revival in your church, you need to get Miller to come speak. And this is in the 1830s, so it's a long time from 1844, so they're not quite worried about the pressure of what's going to happen if Jesus doesn't come and all that kind of thing. Revival is breaking out. And so the circle keeps getting larger if you kind of plot on a map where his invitations are coming from. By June of 1835, he's up into southern Canada. And a, a lady, who I believe was his sister, as near as I could put it together, but a lady came up to him and handed him the first money that anybody had ever offered to pay him for coming to, to preach. And she gave him two half dollars which for any coin collectors here that ever collected American coins, you know, Canada wasn't even in existence yet, so these would have to be American half dollars or the equivalent in the British, but it says specifically in the story, two half dollars. So I would contend that Miller should be the patron saint of ASI because his was a self-supporting ministry, you know? Um, his farm, his kids, his wife, they tended the farm, so he had the money to go travel to preach. William Miller's agreement with God to share his recent discoveries affected his entire family. Everyone worked hard in the field so that he would be able to preach and share the news that they had come to believe. Jesus was about to return again. Although he stuck to his original agreement with God that he would only preach when invited, invitations continued to come in. As time went on, his influence began to be felt. And the circle keeps getting larger and larger until by 1839, he has, Miller has not yet preached 
and spoken in any of the large cities along the East Coast, like Boston or Philadelphia or Washington, D.C., but he's getting close to that area. And in 1839, he receives an invitation from a man named Timothy Cole. Now, Timothy Cole had never met Miller. Cole is this young minister who has heard about revival and reformation, and he wants that in his church. So he writes to Miller and invites Miller to come and speak in his church. Now, as I said, he's never met him. He doesn't know what he looks like. And so he writes to Miller and says, how will I know you if and when you get here? And Miller said, well, I will be wearing a white hat and a camlet, which was some kind of cloth, a camlet coat. So I could, in my imagination, for years, I pictured this young, energetic minister walking up and down on the platform, waiting for the train to come in for this prominent person who's making such a difference in preaching William Miller to come and speak in his church in Lowell, Massachusetts. Well, I used to think he was young and thin until I saw a picture of him. And now I picture him as a little heavier set, even as a young person, than how I used to have him in my imagination. But this is Timothy Cole. All right, so I picture this young man, or now a little heavier man, um, going up and down, waiting for the train to come in. Now, what kind of train did they have in those days? You've seen pictures probably of trains in the 19th century, but this is 1839. This is the way the trains were back in those days, 1839, not even a cab on them. The engineers stood outside and tried to move the levers to get everything to move forward. And so they apparently squeaked and hissed and made all kinds of strange sounds, and they would do at top speed of maybe 25 or 30 miles an hour, and uh, so it's a little primitive, more primitive than what you may be thinking about when you think about the train arriving. So eventually the train comes in and it squeaks and squeals and whistles and makes all kinds of noises and comes to a stop. And Timothy Cole is standing there looking for this man. He's probably thinking he's someone tall, distinguished, handsome, who's having this kind of impact. Remember, no newspaper photograph, no photographs hardly in those days and certainly nothing in the in the newspaper, so he doesn't know exactly what he looks like, except he's looking for a white hat and a camlet coat. Pretty soon, all that's standing that's there that got off the train is an older gentleman. This is by far the most flattering contemporary picture of William Miller. There's an older gentleman standing there. He is 1.7 meters tall, 5 feet 7 inches tall. He's got a white hat on and a camlet coat. And I can imagine that Cole looked over at him and said, oh my word, is that what I invited to come to my church? Five foot seven inches, 1.7 meters tall. He has auburn or reddish hair. He's described in the newspapers as having had a round, um, uh, kind of a round face, a bull neck, and a body that is a bit corpulent. Do you know the old word corpulent? If you don't know the old word corpulent, let me demonstrate. This is corpulent, so he's overweight, okay? So he looks over to, oh, and then I didn't tell you. The newspapers also tell us that when Miller spoke, when he spoke, he had a tremor. Did you know his hands and his head shook? I don't know if you knew that. Now, picture that. Here is a man, a younger minister, looking at this older man, He's got the white hat, this round face, the bull neck, the body that's corpulent, and he has a tremor. Now, you can imagine why Cole feels the way he did. He's probably thinking to himself, oh, last Sunday when I announced that Miller was coming here to speak, why, oh, hopefully everybody thinks it's two weeks from now so I can get the word out that, that there's a mistake. Look at that man. He's gonna preach in my church? No, can't be. Oh, I made a terrible mistake. It's what's going, apparently going through Cole's mind. Now, the story tells us that Cole heads for home, and he leaves William Miller to come struggling along behind. I don't know what size traveling trunk Miller had, but I do know it had no wheelies on it. 
And here's the older man, you know, coming along, trying to keep up with the younger man because they were to go home for a meal and then go to the church. Now, what did they have for their meal? I don't know. The story doesn't tell us what they had. But just for sake of illustration, let's say they had soup. Now, can you imagine what's going through the young man's mind? The old man is trying to eat soup. They go to the church. Cole is a coarse feeling that he's made one of the biggest mistakes in his life, inviting Miller to this service. And um, he shows Miller to the pulpit. He does not even walk up into the pulpit with William Miller. A message never before preached was now to be presented in this Boston church through a messenger who was totally unassuming. Was William Miller ready to share his studies with people of such different culture and standards? This first visit to Cole's congregation would answer that question. Cole goes and sits down somewhere in the congregation. We're not told how he sat, but I'm guessing his posture would have been like this. Look at what I have got. This is this, and the church is packed. Everybody's here, and look at what I have, what I have invited to be here. Now, William Miller was not used to being treated quite like this, and so it took him a little while to get himself organized as to what he would, how he would start, because this is the first time he's been introduced, apparently, or not introduced like this, just showed to the pulpit. And I would submit to the man who at this point was preaching about two sermons a day on average, several days a week, knew what a pulpit looked like. He didn't have to have it pointed out to him. He could have found it by himself if Cole didn't want to go up there. But the story says he pointed him to it and then went. So here he is. He lines out a hymn. I would say hey, which hymn we try to sing it this afternoon. It could, that's, we don't have a record of which hymn. He lined out a second hymn. By then, he had his composure sufficient to begin his lecture. And he opened his lecture with the text that, according to that textbook that I mentioned, where he records his text for all of the service for all these years that he preached, the one that he used the more than any other one, Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious, the glorious appearing of the great God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And he begins to share with people why he thinks his best friend Jesus will be returning in a short time. And at the end of that series, Timothy Cole decides he wants to be a Millerite Adventist preacher. Gives you some idea of the impact that Miller's preaching is having even on preachers. What began like a trickle of water in upstate New York was now expanding to a flood that was sweeping across New England. Miller's studies of Jesus' second return brought encouragement and hope to the hearts of listeners as well as readers, who through preaching and publishing became convicted of the Savior's soon return. Part of Miller's uh, life that you study the most in our schools is the part from about the time he's beginning to be associated with Joshua V. Hines and publishing the signs. They were publishing the signs, the Midnight Cry, and all that. So for those next three or four years, you know that the movement is growing and it's expanding and Miller's getting more invitations. Other people, other Millerite lectures, there's estimates as many as 700 or more lecturers that were preaching here in New England during the next few years. So let's move on down to 1844. Late 1843, as I mentioned the other day, someone, some of the newspaper people said to Miller, you have been predicting the end of the world it would be sometime around the year 1843. Could you be more precise? And Miller chose the beginning and ending dates of the Jewish year, said, I believe it will be sometime between March 21, 1843 and March 21, 1844, because Miller was very familiar with the text that no man knows the day nor the hour. But if you have 2,300 years, why well, you should be able to say it's going to be sometime during that year. I don't know which day, but sometime during the year. Well, March 21, 1844 came and went, as we discussed the other day. Someone wrote to William 
Miller shortly after the, what we call now the spring disappointment. A man, one of colleagues of Miller by the name of Elon Galusha wrote to Miller and asked him how he was holding up. As I mentioned uh, to some last night when we were talking, I collect Adventist history, some people collect other things. I collect Adventist history. So in my collection at home, I have probably 250, 300 new, original newspapers from the 1840s that mention the Millerites. And when you come up to the spring disappointment, and again, when you come up to the October 22 disappointment, believe me, it was not easy being a Millerite. The stuff that was being printed in the newspapers, editorials in the papers, stories that circulate against the Millerites, um, I mean, it was not an easy time. So for Miller, who was the leader of the group, it had to have been a very difficult, challenging time. So Galusha writes to him after the spring disappointment, and he says something that has impacted my thinking ever since the first time I read this a number of years ago. How are you doing? Thanks for asking. And I'm paraphrasing now, I'll quote in a minute. Thanks for asking. I'm doing okay. And now I'm quoting. Why then should I complain? If God should give a few days, even months more as a probation time for some to find salvation. It is my Savior's will and I rejoice that He will do all things right. Let them call me whatever they want from the pulpit. Let the kids on the streets make fun of me. Let the jokes be told in the newspapers. What's it to me? If Jesus wants to wait a little longer to save a few more people that he died for on the cross, he's going to do it all right. Want to talk about the measure of a man? When you're the butt of jokes all across the country? Wow. And I must say, in my own thinking, since I read this several years ago, the so-called delay of the advent, I don't worry much about anymore. I used to. Of course I want Jesus to come. Don't misunderstand me. But if he wants to take a little while longer to save a few more people that he died for, what's it to me? I think Miller had it right. Anyway, you go through, we talked to the other day about the summer of 1844. They're in kind of an uncharted waters. We talked about the uh, Exeter camp meeting and Samuel Snow. And Miller himself does not accept the October 20 date, uh, October 22 date until October 6, because no man knows the day nor the hour. So he does not himself. Some of the other Millerite leaders, they're jumping in and accepting it, but not William Miller himself until October 6, at which time he, he, uh, is, he writes, glory, 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 I'm almost home. He realizes that something's happening. What is it that impresses Miller at this point? Well, it's very uncharacteristic of Miller. It's not scripture. He cannot deny the impact of the preaching of the first angel's message. It is so much stronger, so much more powerful than anything he had witnessed up to that point. He had said, God has to be in this. And so he accepts the October 22 date. That certainty that had come to fill the heart of Miller also burned in thousands across the United States. People who read and heard about the return of Christ several years ago now found themselves facing a set date, waiting only a few hours for the most anticipated meeting in the history of the world. However, the night before October 22, so that would be October 21, the night before October 22, the Millerites in this area were invited to Miller's house. And um, he, he tells us that, he says to them, I mean, he implies in the letter and then, and then says, he implies that he's hoping, like everything, that Jesus is going to come the next day. But he, imply, he, but he goes on to say, but we, he's going to come what? As a thief in the night, when we least expect it. And we're all going to be watching tomorrow. And so scripture is now coming back into Miller's thinking. And though he wants Jesus to come the next day, he's not so sure it could happen because it won't fulfill scripture. He thinks they're gonna be disappointed the next day. 
on the one hand, concern about biblical accuracy. On the other, the earnest wish that it could be true. How must Miller and his followers have felt when the first rays of sunlight appeared on October 22? After years of tirelessly spending their time, resources, and even lives in preaching about Jesus' second coming, this could not just be a common awakening. Imagine the feeling of the people who were worn out in preaching, who had sold everything they had, who said goodbye to everyone they had known, and who now looked to the heavens, waiting for the Savior to come and take them home. The hours of that day passed as their eyes were trained on the skies. October 22 came to an end. And Jesus did not come. And of course, they're tragically disappointed the next day. And the most forceful description of that disappointment is uh, Higher Medicine's description, which we'll talk about when we get out to the Higher Medicine Farm tomorrow afternoon. So Miller now has gone through two major disappointments. And you know the uh, statement that he wrote shortly after that, I have fixed my mind on another time, and here I mean to stand until God gives me more light. And that is, anybody know? Today, today, and today, until he comes. Miller did a little more public work, work for the next couple of years after uh, October 22, 1844, but his health is broken down. He had given everything to the preaching of the first angel's message. He never accepted the second. He always thought you should stay in your church. He did not understand the Sabbath, the sanctuary, um, state of the dead, these cardinal doctrines that we hold so dear. He gave his energy preaching the first angel's message. I want to close by reading something to you that William Miller wrote. And it will give you some idea about the passion that William Miller had for the second coming of Christ. Now, when you hear this, if you've never heard this before, you may think, well, he wrote this in 1844. No, he didn't. He wrote this in 1832. But he never lost this passion, this belief in the literal return of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to just read part of it. I'm not going to read all of it, but I'm going to read a few lines that Miller wrote to his friend, Truman Hendricks, on May 20, 1832. It's his view of what he expected to see happen when Jesus returned in the clouds of heaven. Look, look again. See crowns and kings and kingdoms tumbling to the dust. See lords and nobles, captains and mighty men all arming for the bloody demon fight. See the carnivorous fowls fly screaming through the air. See, see these signs. Behold, the heavens grow black with clouds. The sun has veiled himself. The moon, pale and forsaken, hangs in middle air. The hail descends. The seven thunders utter loud their voices. The lightning send their vivid gleams of sulfurous flame abroad. And the great city of the nations falls to rise no more forever and forever. At this dread moment, look, look, oh, look and see what means that ray of light. The clouds have burst asunder, the heavens appear, the great white throne is in sight. Amazement fills the universe with awe. He comes, he comes, behold, the Savior comes. Lift up your heads, ye saints, he comes, he comes, he comes. And he signed it. William Miller. Here we are today, gathered in the little chapel that William Miller built because he had been disfellowshipped from the Baptist church down on the corner. And we are Seventh-day what? We're Seventh-day Adventists. I think the question needs to be asked of all of us. I ask it of myself every time I come here. How real, how vivid is the second coming of Christ? in your life today.
in your thinking today. But William Miller, it overarched everything else he did. He thought about every person he saw was someone who was a candidate for heaven. How real is it for us? How real is Jesus and his soon return? Holding on to faith in times of disappointment and difficulty is one of the hardest things to do. Deep disappointments are only possible when we long for something desperately. The second coming of Jesus was truly the blessed hope for all who awaited his return in 1844. While Miller's conclusions about the prophecy of Daniel 8.14 were mistaken, his faith and love for Jesus are undeniable. His continued faith in his Savior until his death a few years later are an enduring testimony to all of us of the power of God to sustain us even when we don't understand the reasons for our experience. In our next episode, we travel to Port Gibson, New York, where a group of believers are struggling with the effects of their deep disappointment and seeking God's guidance.